best. I got my life back now. Now I can enjoy every day that I live. I can really enjoy myself. And before, even a good day was hell. I mean, I couldn't enjoy nothing. But now I can enjoy myself. That's when I said wonderful. I look at the future the same way uh, uh, um, a young guy, 25, 30 year old would. His biggest problem was he would sleep a lot. And I mean, uh, he slept, he was at the point where um, he was could be sitting in here talking like I'm talking and fall right off to sleep while he was talking. I went to the point where I had to put his socks and shoes on, his clothes on, his shaving, wash his hair, look out of him just like you would look out of a two or three year old. He said, I'm in so much pain, I've got to have that pain medicine. He said, I just cannot live without that pain medicine. People would look at him and literally think, well, he's got to be drunk or he's got to be high on something. They didn't know, you know, he was just on a lot of medicine. And my phone rang and it was him and he said, oh, I can't go no farther. And the highway patrolman told me within five minutes after I got off the phone with him, he ran off the road. That's when he ran off the road. And they said what happened, our witness behind him said that they thought maybe he'd got distracted, which I knew what was wrong with him. He fell asleep from that medicine. I knew what it was. I think when I first started, I was on 20 milligrams in the morning and 20 in the evening. And it worked. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Since I've been on this new pain medication, I have not missed one day of work, and my boss really appreciates that. Lauren is there every day, so I'm able to be very productive, a productive um, person again, which is really great. Eventually, it stopped working, and it got increased. I think it was 40 in the morning and 40 in the evening, and then eventually that got increased. <laughs> This went on for years, went on for years. I lost my job and I lost my insurance. So it got to the point where <clears throat> I couldn't afford it and I didn't buy it one time and that was the beginning of the end <laughs> for me because I could no longer afford it but that time that I went without it was uh, probably the most unbelievable, excruciating, horrible time of my life. The withdrawals were just unbelievable. I just knew eventually I was, uh, you know, I'd probably kill myself OD taking this medicine. I would never take another Oxycontin. There's, you couldn't get me to take another Oxycontin, never again. Physical therapy hopefully will get me strong enough where eventually I won't need to use the, the, uh, the drug therapy, but the drug therapy allowed me to do the physical therapy, which in turn lowered my blood pressure and lowered the, the, the blood levels. Periodically, he and I would go have lunch together. In the conversation was always the fact that he was taking lots of meds, he had just seen the doctor, or he was just going to see the doctor, or he was about to meet a new doctor. So the word doctor and meds and pain, those words came up over and over and over again. And I would say, where's, where's the pain? I did ask him that. And he'd say, all over, all over, especially my back and my, my arms and my shoulders, all over. When I started taking oxycodone two months ago, 
It was the first time I had felt normal since my original injury 10 years ago. All that time I had suffered greater or lesser extent of pain and now I feel absolutely normal. I, I really, I love what I do and it would be, uh, it would be just heartbreaking for me if I had to give up my career because uh, my back hurt so much I couldn't work. It makes it possible for me to live a more or less uh, normal life. Now this medication does not turn you into a zombie, it, it has turned me into an active person. So the decades long international effort to suppress the legal opium and heroin trade clearly hasn't worked, but that's not a problem for the US drug lords, aka drug warriors. The goal of a free drug world is an elaborate deception, it is an illusion created by the United States Nation's Office on Drugs and Crime slogan promoting health, security, and justice that the United States has declared war on drugs and that the CIA has the CIA has simultaneously promoted cocaine and heroin traffic for its own, you know, aims and purposes shows Deep, contradiction, deep contradictions in the U.S. drug policy, yet there is more of a connection between those two things than first meets the eye. There is an unelected and unaccountable multinational of counter-narcotics agencies led by the UNODC that have an ideological and material stake in continuing the war on drugs and consequently the drug trade. The United States wants and needs a non-stop war on drugs abroad as a pretext to invade a country just to take their resources, you know, typical capitalist pigs, you know, capitalism, you know, the bankers want war, etc. That is the real but hidden agenda of the international war on drugs. It's not about the drugs. It's about how much money can Porky make. So, yeah. Big Pharma just cares about profits because that's what capitalism does. It puts money over human lives of anything. Everything. Every day. Big Pharma creates customers, not cures. Remember that slogan. From as far back as 1911 until the late 1990s, the use of opioids or narcotics was limited to very narrow circumstances such as post-surgical pain and end-of-life care. That's because the medical establishment and regulators were keenly aware of the addictive quality of the drugs at that time and the dangers of post if they were misused by anyone or by customers, but that all changed when a school of thought started to take over in medicine beginning in the late 1990s, early 2000s, treating pain like a pre preeminent priority and addiction was less of a concern to them. Pain was dubbed the fifth vigil. Big Pharma played an important role on this transformation and made billions in the process. Now states, cities, countries, and other jurisdictions across the country and the world are fighting back with lawsuits and investigations hoping to hold drug makers, aka big evil, evil Big Pharma, accountable for the collateral damage of the nation's opioid crisis as a whole because they're the ones who created it. You know, Big Pharma created the opioid crisis. Cat with pigs did because they want to make money. The seeds of an epidemic were planted nearly two decades ago with little or no valid clinical evidence to go on. The medical establishment began prescribing opioids for long-term chronic pain. Doctors and hospitals ratings were even tied to how well they reduced patients' pain. The concept of pseudo addiction was created encouraging doctors to treat patients with some signs of addiction by giving them even more opioids and even more highly addicted drugs. Potent narcotics started to flood the U.S. as sales skyrocketed. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the amount of pres prescription opioids sold to pharmacies, hospitals, and doctor's offices almost quadrupled between 1999 and 2014. The family that owns Purdue Pharma, the Shacklers, became the wealthiest, became one of the wealthiest families in the country with a net worth that reached as high as $14 billion in 2015, largely on the strength of the opioid OxyContin profits. The family was ranked by Far Forbes to be among the 20, 20, the top 20 richest in the U.S. in America. As the family and company's fortune rose, so did the suffering across the country and across the world. 
Between 1999 and 2015, approximately 183,000 Americans died from drug overdoses due to opioids. Um, and opioid overdoses, 15,000 alone, you know, happened in 2015. And over 70% of the 70,630 deaths in 2019 involved an opioid uh, overdose. From 1999 through to the 2019, nearly 500,000 people died from an overdose involving any opioid, whether that is a prescription opioid or illicit opioids. Under the bankruptcy plan filed in 2021, late Monday night, the uh, Purdue Pharma and the uh, CEOs would pay roughly $500 million in cash to settle the hundreds of thousands of juror, uh, lo lawsuits and injury lawsuits, claims linked to the company's role in the deadly opioid epidemic in the United States. The privately owned firm has now admitted twice to illegally marketing opioid medications in a separate plea. Details with the Justice Department once in 2007 and again last year. As part of those agreements, the pharmaceutical company acknowledged lying to doctors and patients about the safety of its product, oxycodone, which became the most widely abused prescription narcotics in the United States alone.